it's time for um, our Edible Applications um, Division E Poster Pitch Competition. So my name is Doug Bevis. I'm your current AOCS president. Really honored to be here. Um, I really enjoyed uh, an e-pitch that I was part of yesterday. So this is really an exciting new approach uh, for our virtual meeting. So, and I'm joined by uh, three judges. The judging panelists are Dr. Amanda Wright. She's an associate professor at the University of Guelph in Canada. Dr. Philippe Van Boxdal, he's a professor at Ghent University in Belgium, and Dr. Kustav Vadakara, he's a principal application specialist at IFF in Denmark. So what's going to happen today, we have um, uh, five students, they're going to present for five minutes each, or up to five minutes each on their research uh, using uh, PowerPoint presentations, and then uh, we'll have uh, a five-minute Q&A session after each presentation, so you'll be able to ask questions. Um, and then um, uh, there's also a, um, so there's three votes from three judges, and then the audience votes as well. After the first three contestants, uh, we'll have a vote, and then after the second two, we'll have a vote. So your vote um, uh, is 25% of the overall vote, so your audience uh, voting is very important. So really encourage you to do that. So we're gonna start today with um, the first candidate is Maria Romero Pena. Um, she is a PhD candidate at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon, Canada. Got some really good friends that live there. Um, she uh, is also a professor at Escuela Superior Politecnica de la Toro in Ecuador. So Maria is in the PhD program at Saskatchewan uh, since 2017 under the su supervision of Dr. Super Tim Dosh. And her thesis is development of stable liquid water and oil emulsions by modifier, modifying emulsion aqueous phase interactions for food and related applications. And the title of her talk today is Viscoelastic Improvement of Water and Oil Emulsions for Food and Related Applications. So thank you, Marina, for joining us. everyone, thank you for attending my presentation. One of the current challenges in the food industry is the development of low fat margarine type table spreads with glycerol monolith. So this type of emulsion with glycerol monolith are very complicated systems to stabilize. For example, here, this emulsion is, it has no additive in the aqueous phase, as you can see, it's completely destabilized. However, this emulsion contains low methoxyl pectin in the aqueous phase, and this emulsion reach near the 80% of stability. So this led us our project to develop a viscoelastic improvement of wiring oil emulsions for food and related applications. So to modify this liquid state to a solid-like properties. So now I'm gonna show you the methodology that we use. In the aqueous phase, we add 1.5% of low methoxyl pectin, LMP. In the continuous oil phase, there was canola oil, we add 7% of hydrogenated serving oil, which create a crystal network to give support. Then GMO and water was at the constant radio ratio of 0 0.065. So we keep constant because we want to remain similar water droplets uh, size. So LMP emulsions, we develop in four different levels of water, 20, 30, 40, and 50%. And control emulsions had the same ingredients without LMP. So control emulsions contain two levels of water, 20 and 50%, and all the emulsions were prepared with two steps of homogenization. First, the rotor stator, and second, the high pressure homogenizer. So now let's see the, the results. Here are the stability results on day 30. For control emulsions, 20% water, it show a flow. For 50% water, there was a phase separation at the bottom, as you can see here. However, LMP emulsions did not show any separation or flow. So now this is the apparent viscosity results, which is a flow resistant. We give, we give us a, an idea about that. So viscosity is showing Pascal per second, and as the share rate increase, the viscosity decrease. This behavior is uh, shared thinning viscosity. And 
comparing day one to day 30, almost all emulsions remains in value or increase a bit. However, control emulsion with 20% water show a significant drop. This was related with this flow in the, in the stability test. So now for the storage modulus, a storage modulus is G prime is related to the elastic capac capacity of emulsions. So just for comparison purposes, I'm gonna show for a 0.01% of the strength. So all the, all the emulsions show an increase, a G prime increase with the rise of water content. As you can see here, LMP, however, and this is for the control of 50%. However, control percent 20 show a significant drop compared with 20 percent uh, emulsion with containing LMP. Now the crossover strain it will give us the is the strain required to for gel breakdown. So here is showing the crossover strain versus the water content, and you will see that for day one and day 30. So all the LMP emulsions show a proportional increase with the water content. Compared with both controls that show significantly lower values, this indicates that LMP uh, form a, a higher gear strength in all emulsions. So now I want to show you the mechanism behind this. So 20% uh, wiring oil canal emulsions with LMP form a viscoelastic gel due to the less wire droplets. However, without LMP, there was evidence that it was a liquid light flow due to the emulsion destabilization. With the highest water content, 50%, wearing all emulsions with LMP form a strong elastic gel due to the droplet aggregation and packing. However, without LMP, definitely was a strong gel, but mainly due to the partial release of the stabilized water droplets and predominant fat crystal networks. Overall, the increase of water content containing LMP and HSO with GMO allowed the development of viscoelastic properties of wiring canola oil emulsions being an innovative alternative for low fat spreads. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna answer the, the questions after the, in the QA. Okay, Uh, thanks, Maria. Excellent presentation. Uh, we're going to open questions up to our judges now for you. Sure, Doc. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, thanks, Maria. Really nice job. You exemplified your data in a really effective way um, and highlighted the, pro the problem that you're challenging, uh, challenged to tackle at the very start. So really nice work. Um, one of my questions was, what mo motivated your decision to use low methoxypectin in particular? Well, we tried different molecules that have hydroxyl donating, hydroxyl group donating agents. So we have a previous research where we show, we identified that this, the pectin was the best molecule that interact with GMO at the interface. That's why this is a further research after that. Okay. And do you expect that you might see differences in the stability of your emulsions based on things like pH, if you were to put this into a yeah. food application? Uh, so far, we have worked only with the addition of the hydroxyl group donating agents, but definitely it's, it's an idea that we can do it in the future, do more work in the future, yeah. So far, it's only for pH three. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Maria. I think it was also great. I love the way you drew the mechanisms and all. I think it was very depictive. Uh, yeah, apart from the pH questions Amanda had, my question was, you know, typical margarines and spreads always contain a bit of uh, protein for a faster flavor uh, release emulsion breakdown. So because with all the emulsifiers, it can be a very tight emulsion, you know, thinking to a practical application in mind. So have we ever tried thinking adding a little bit of uh, skim milk powder or a dairy protein in the water phase? Or do you expect any destabilization effect from that when you add protein? Well, I have read uh, studies that they have been using another like, proteins, as you mentioned, and forming like a, a, a network to. However, now it's like our research is basically because in a study before it was found like 
canola oil emulsions or vegetable oil emulsions are very complicated systems to stabilize. So our idea is, was to find what was the reason and try to solve this problem. And mm -hmm. we found that it was for the hydroxyl group donating agents that GMO is a small emulsifier but need this bonding in like a, enhance the bonding because it is a bonding that happens but GMO distort of the interface. So, so far we are keeping or project like uh, trying to like to solve that that problem mm. that that have been happening for many years. So, but definitely it's a good idea for the future for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because you know I'm from the industry and all the fantastic work you guys do. I always want to translate it back to the industry to the consumers, so yeah. I can enjoy that as consumers because this can be a, a great uh, application. And one other point, you know, you have fully hydrogenated soybean oil which would melt very steep. I mean, like it's, it doesn't melt that well. So in maybe in some cases, have you tried something that melts more, you know, more smoothly. steeply, more yeah, smoothly? Um, is, you, you're right. So, so far now we found, we did analysis of solidified content in this project. Uh, I'm not showing the data here, but um, Definitely, what actually we propose in the future is not using hydrogenated saving oil. It's actually using another type of emulsifier, like a particles that enhance mm. the network, like a substitution, partial substitution, right? But yeah, definitely something that we have to look uh, in the future. But there are so many things that we want to do after this. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, hello, uh, Maria, also from my side. Big thanks for your uh, nice pitch. It already solved some of my questions. So from that perspective, it was already enlightening. Um, you, you said uh, uh, you're targeting the, the, the table spread or the fat spread application. Huh? Um, did you ever also include a reference, a commercial reference? of a table spread and do you think your rheology values that you obtain are close to commercial applications? Good boy, really good question. Um, definitely something that we we want to do, but at the beginning it's like, you know, we were trying to change something that was liquid to solid by this solution. So I think all your, the, the questions that you made me today, uh, open to more stuff to do, right? Comparing, analyzing with inner compounds. So, but I think it's a good start. So far we haven't done, but. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, you use the GMO as an emulsifier. Yes. Um, could you shortly tell a bit more about that choice? So glycerol monolate uh, is a amazing emulsifier, have very good properties at the interface. Um, in general, we want to choose GMO because, you know, PGPR has been emulsifier that has been used for so many years in wearing oil emulsions. But in mm -hmm. Canada, this emulsifier was banned since 2018. So there, there are some, I mean, the last maybe 10 years, tried to smoothly change that part, right? So that's why we went to this type of emulsifier mm -hmm. that is also have a very good interaction, but the structure is very small. So mm. we try to... How, do you think there is an interaction with that emulsifier and the fat crystals? Uh, GMO has been uh, identified in, a, in previous analysis, like it helped to localize the crystal at the interface. So if the crystal is not sulfate active, the GMO will help in the polarity and kind of surround the, the water droplet. Yeah. yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Philip, Suprotein loves GMO. I know a lot of Suprotein's work is based on GMO. <laughs> I've had discussions with him, he loves it. <laughs> but he has a reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know. Okay. Thank okay. you so much. Fantastic. Thank you. Mm. Marie, very much.
Hey, so welcome back. Uh, it's our second e-pitch today. It's by Kunal Kadia. Uh, Kunal is a PhD candidate at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Uh, his research areas include developing food grade nano emulsions, exploring the use of protein and biopolymers and making bilayer emulsion gels and studying their rheology and digestion behavior. Uh, Kunal received his master's in dairy science from the National Dairy Institute in India worked on the technology to develop a probiotic cheese as part of this master's research. The title of Canal's presentation for today is Effect of Interfacial Composition on the Rheological and Digestion Behavior of Emulsion. So welcome, Canal. Thanks, Doc, for the introductions. Uh, hi, everyone. So today I'm going to deliver my e-poster pitch on effect of interfacial composition on the rheological and digestion behavior of emulsions. So we know that we consume uh, many food emulsion cells in our day-to-day -day life, but uh, typically if I'm talk about the, the, the emulsion cells like uh, mayonnaise, which has around 80% fat, the closed pack structure created by the repulsive droplet, it's giving the food gel kind of structure here. In my research, the goal is to create the mayonnaise-like structure with low fat, in, particularly in mayonnaise that it, with 80% oil, the effective volume fraction is very similar to the actual oil volume fractions. And here is the equation how we can calculate the effective volume fractions. But my objective is to reduce the droplet size here and then increase the interfacial thickness so that uh, I can get the similar kind of structure at lower oil concentration by increasing the effective volume fractions. Uh, my hypothesis is that uh, by reducing the droplet size from co emulsion to the nano emulsion, and then by putting the second layer of a biopolymer onto the nanoscale droplet, we can increase the interfacial thickness. And this will allow the droplets to close back and those close back structure will not allow the droplet to move. And the droplet would be, you know, kind create a gel kind of structure from the liquid emulsions. Uh, to illustrate this one in a simple way, I have a really good example here. So we can see here the herd of sheep where the, without the wool on their body, actually, they can move really easily. But think on the other sides, when they have really thick wool on their uh, body, they cannot move easily around. So that's the importance of the wool thickness there. Similarly, in my research, actually, the interfacial thickness can play a similar role. And the close pack structure created by the, that uh, a much higher contribution of the interfacial thickness can lead to the gel kind of structures in the emulsions. Another advantage of creating a gel-like structure would be uh, we hypothesize that the, the digestion behavior, like the digestion behavior would be, the digestion would reduce in that case when we have a thick interfacial layer because our hypothesis is that the light based uh, actions on the triglyceride molecule will restrict because of the higher interfacial thickness, which will delay the lipase action. And uh, there is possibility to reduce the digestion of the lipid in that case also. So with that hypothesis, how did we reduce the droplet size to the nanoscale? So we use the very surface active food grade emulsifier citrim with 40% oil, and we use the high pressure homogenizer to reduce the droplet size to nanoscale around 200 nanometers. Our second approach was to reduce or to increase the interfacial thickness. To increase the interfacial thickness, we use the uh, positively charged chitosan polymer to deposit onto the negatively charged citrum stabilized droplet. And by increasing the interfacial thickness, we just want to achieve the, the close pack structure. And uh, for this uh, particular research, we use the different concentration of chitosan and with different positive charge of the chitosan, that is the degree of deacetylation. But for the time sake, uh, I will just uh, uh, presenting the results using the DD93 chitosans. Come to the results. So gel strength. So we compared the gel strength by plotting the storage modulus as a function of chitosan concentration. So higher the storage modulus, then higher the gel strength of the emulsions. We can see the, the with the monolayer citrin stabilized emulsion, the emulsion was kind of liquid. But with the increase in chitosan concentration, we can see that we were able to create the gel kind of structure with higher storage modulus. And then eventually at 0.25% chitosan, we can see the storage modulus still reduced the compared to uh, the intermediate concentration of chitosan. This could be understood by the, the uh, the confocal microstructure of the emulsions, uh, and at the bottom we have the 
the droplet charge and the droplet size. So we can see that uh, at 0% kytosan, when only citrum stabilized droplets were there, droplets were uh, very nicely distributed with the negative charge and with the lower droplet size. But as we added the kytosan, the droplets were flocculated, probably because the polymer concentration was not enough. That leads to the bridging flocculation among the droplets. And that's created the, you know, the aggregated structure or attractive emulsion gel. Uh, at intermediate concentration. But as we increase the chitosan concentration to the higher concentration at 0.25%, we can see the, the droplets was positively charged, repositively charged. And again, we can see the decrease in droplet size. So this close pack structure created by the, the positively charged and the higher interfacial thickness can lead to the close pack structure and the droplet cannot move. And it's actually increased the storage modulus around 10 times than the um, sheet time stabilized droplets. Another objective was to, to evaluate the digestion behavior. And we uh, analyzed the digestion behavior of emulsion by uh, following the InfoGest 2 protocols and by uh, PSTAT protocol, actually. On the right side, we can see that the fatty acid profiles of the emulsions uh, at different stages of the digestions. Uh, we can see that the, the digestion of the emulsions reduce as we increase the chitosan concentration. And when the the droplets are completely covered by the chitosan. The digestibility was reduced from 25% uh, to the uh, 17%. And uh, that's because of the, uh, the restrictions on the lipase actions on the tri triglycerides molecules. To summarize these things in terms of the gel standard lipid digestibility, uh, uh, by this research, actually, we got three different kinds of structures. Uh, liquid nanoemulsions, when the, when the droplets are only stabilized by the citrum only, that's the mono monolayer emulsions. But as we added the chitosan, we can see that the, 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 the storage modulus increased and the kind of uh, gel we got, it was because of the bridging flocculation. But at higher concentration, the droplets were completely covered by the chitosan and the increase in repulsive nature between the droplets and increase in the interfacial thickness leads to the increase in the gel strength and the kind of gel structures. The similar effect we observed on the lipid digestibility as we have uh, like the droplets were more and more covered by the chitosan, the digestibility was reduced and uh, uh, it was reduced around like from 25 to the 17 percent. So the takeaway message from my research is that uh, by creating this kind of structure, it can be uh, used into the low fat uh, products with the controlled digestibility. Uh, uh, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer your questions. Uh, thank you, Kanal. That was a great presentation. Really enjoyed it. Some really good science here. So, judges, do you have some questions for Kanal and his paper? Yeah, Kanal, I think it was very interesting, you know, because when you when I look into it, uh, mayonnaise, it's definitely tasty, but definitely also high fat. So often I wonder if low fat ones can also taste as good as the high fat ones, right? Um, it's interesting, you know, so when we talk about mayonnaise, normally people only use liquid oils, canola, sunflower, soybean, and in many parts of the world, those are very expensive oils, while palmoline is very cheap, but palmoline still has a bit of solids that is that does not sit well in emulsion like mayonnaise. So do you think this kind of double layering, you can prevent a bit of, what do you call it, um, I don't know, if it suppress crystallization a bit, so it does not connect and separate? Can you have tried? So we use the canola oil for this study. So yeah. we didn't have any experience with the other oil, but uh, it would be really great to, you know, look into that part as well. And uh, probably it is possible to, you know, creating a, this kind of interfacial thickness to, you know, uh, what you are targeting that can be also mm -hmm. achieved. There are many other aspects of, you know, uh, uh, by coating the droplet, this is kind of the encapsulation process. You are just giving the, uh, high interfacial thickness to the droplets, and uh, the our uh, our main objective is to just look onto the gel strength and then the digestibility. But uh, that could that can also be checked in the future, actually, with yeah. different. Uh, well, I think from the industry point of view, I mean, for customers would be quite interested if you can suppress so it does not crystallize out of the droplets, right? Another question: What's the main role of the citrem? Do you think here? Because you added three percent. That's a lot of emulsifiers. They're good for our business, but people don't buy that much amount. Yeah. So to, for the today's presentation, I have the time limit. Otherwise, <coughs> uh, 
my whole research and even I published the paper on this actually. So we used three person, but uh, we removed the excess citrum from the continuous phase. So the mm. role of the citrum is that it's first we wanted to make the food grade emul emulsion actually. So what we that's why we use the citrum and citrum is a really surface active molecule to reduce the droplet size to nanoscale. But the science says that you need really high amount of emulsifier when you want to reduce the droplet size to the nanoscales. And uh, another, that's the problem when you want to put the second layer onto the droplets, excess emulsifier actually into the continuous phase can react with the polymer first. So your polymer cannot go to the interface. So what we did actually, we removed the excess and then we were able to deposit the second layer onto the droplets. So although it's a three person, but I have the data and the data says that I have removed around 1.2% of the citrine from the continuous phase. So probably in the second phase, secondary emulsion, I have around 1.5 to 1.6% uh, citrine into the, onto the droplet actually. And I think just one couple of commands that, you know, if when uh, you can also try datums, they're also very surface active. In fact, for mayonnaise, we promote a lot of datum instead of citrine because uh, when you talk about C-trims, you need to identify what kind of C-trim was it, what kind of monoglyceride was there, or what's the acid value. Because C-trims can have such a wide range. Maybe yeah. in the paper you did, but in this short uh, scope you didn't. But yeah, definitely so I can job. answer that question actually. We used the, the C-trim with the HLB value of 9 to 10. So it mm -hmm. was kind of intermediate range, which has really surface activity actually compared to the, the lower HLB value. <clears throat> Focus on the acid value. HLB okay. is pretty empirical. The acid value will tell you how, how much amount of <clears throat> actual citric acid esters are there. But that's a different discussion. But very good. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gus. Now, thank you. I really enjoyed that as well. Um, you made excellent use of your schematics and visuals. Um, the, the sheep diagram in particular was very telling to demonstrate the bilayer effect. Um, and your summary slide where you overlaid uh, things in the schematic to really um, integrate your findings, I thought was especially well done. So I enjoyed it overall. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more about your digestibility uh, differences and, and why you might be targeting decreased digestibility in your, as, an, as an end goal. Yeah, so uh, we want to just reduce the digestibility. The goal is that actually, so... Uh, suppose if you are taking the food, but uh, when you take the high calorie food, definitely the, the digestibility, you know, the, in terms of I'm talking about the calorie you are taking. So here the thing is that if you have the control over that release actually during the digestion, definitely the energy intake. So probably, so the human beings are such that they are working and they are consuming the energy from the food actually. So the thing is that to, we just want to control that process actually. So the second layer, the chitosan, or maybe we can put the, some other interfacial composition. So this is really generalized statement. When you have really thick interfacial layer, then it is possible to uh, reduce the digestibility or control the digestibility. This concept is also used in many other applications for the control release of the bioactive molecule from to the droplets. So that's what our objective actually. So come uh, to get the gel strength at lower oil concentration, and then. To reduce the digestibility, so that would be kind of you know the functional food in that case to reduce yeah, the calorie I mean, content. Yeah, I mean, some people might challenge to say, well, do you really want to prevent uh, too much digestibility? Where will where will that go? Um, I, I understand what you're saying about from a caloric perspective, um, but what are our systems made to handle a whole bunch of uh, undigested lipids in the lower intestine, for example? Um, that's a really good question, actually, and we didn't look on that, actually. So this was a kind of in vitro digestion, but yeah. uh, that would be really great to start, uh, like, you know, uh, try these kind of emails in an animal EV was study as well. So probably that would give you a better idea, like uh, how these emulsions are behaving. Actually. Yeah, I was particularly interested when you said to control the digestibility. I mean, maybe not to uh, stop digestibility per se, but in order to yeah. tailor it so that you might have some sort of controlled release, especially yeah. as you said, with respect to the bioactives. So yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. Okay, Kunal, also from my side, uh, many thanks for your uh, pitch. I enjoyed also the visuals like Amanda already said. Thank you. Um, and I also love the nanostructure approach uh, to create these uh, these uh, microstructures. Um, you showed some confocal uh, microscope 
pictures. Yeah. Um, but of course, you do not really see like a bilayer in those pictures. D did you ever try to also visualize with other uh, yes. techniques uh, so we the have nanostructure? The, yes. So we have the uh, SCM images actually, and we can really see the the second layer onto the chitosan second layer onto that. And uh, to, you know, uh, uh, in the confocal structure, actually, we also added the another dye, fast green, which okay. can really react with the chitosan, and we can see those structure. But uh, the thing is yeah. that the uh, the kind of confocal we have in our university, it's not that really great to focus onto the interface specifically. So we are trying to get those data by uh, SCM actually. Apart from that. Uh, we are also trying to look onto the structure using the use ask actually. So we already did that study. We have the data, okay. we are analyzing those things. So probably in the future, we'll come out with the paper where we'll come out with the thickness of interface and then how the chitosan is actually contributing into that. Okay, and that's possible with use ask to get some information from that or? Yes, we are targeting that thing and we'll look, we are looking forward to that yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah. Okay, looking forward to that re those results. Um, you're using Citram. Yes. I was just wondering, eh, because there is a huge clean label trend in industry, are there clean label alternatives for this type of emulsifier to produce nano emulsions? Yeah. So Citram is actually food grade uh, synthetic. It's a synthetic emulsifier, but it's a food grade. And uh, uh, there was a project actually Nestle did with the, some university actually. And uh, uh, citrum stabilizing from formula actually. And they did the study for this one. And they said that it is really easy to digestible. It's, it doesn't have any adverse effect. So, okay. and those data are already published on that. And yeah. based on that, we also uh, try to use the citrum actually. Okay, but you don't know that there is an alternative? For uh, alternative is there actually. So uh, basically actually we want to make mm -hmm. the two layer. So the first layer should be negatively charged droplet. And uh, for that, we need the emulsifier, which gives the really narrow droplet actually. So uh, people use the sodium dodecyl sulfate for a negatively charged droplet, but that's not a food grid. So yeah. the yeah. alternative we yeah. found is the citrum actually. Yeah. 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 And the ketosone, does it have any nutritional property or, or uh, advantage? Um, ketosone is like, uh, uh, nutritional in terms of like it has the uh, it can help to reduce the you know the uh, reduction in the cholesterol I heard about but uh, not in detail actually and we didn't study about those things but uh, um, the focus for this research is to use the chitosan because there, mm -hmm. there is only one biopolymer available which is having the positive charge and to quote onto the system we need the positively charged uh, biopolymer so that's how it will be used the uh, chitosan without you know, uh, digging into the details of how chitosan will be, you know, helpful in the uh, health benefits, actually. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Kunal. Uh, great discussion, good questions. And uh, we'll move on to our next speaker. Hi everyone, thank you for the, this introduction. I would like to uh, first ask uh, before presenting, has uh, anyone heard about flexitarianism? Well, flexitarianism is an increasingly popular plant-based diet that aims to reduce our carbon footprint and to, and to improve our health through a shift toward vegan and vegetarian foods, but with occasional meat or fish dish. The rise of the flexitarian diet is a result of people taking a more environmentally sustainable approach to what they eat by reducing their meat and dairy product consumption in exchange for alternative plant sources. 
it is attracting more and more people. Maybe you are becoming a flexitarian too. And uh, as a result, you may have seen on the agri-food markets that more and more vegan, vegetarian and dairy fruit products are launched. A, 20, a 25% increase uh, in vegetarian product launches between 2012 and 2016 was reported. And a 200% increase in uh, vegan option during the same time. This shift in consumer preferences is putting the spotlight on uh, plant-based ingredient. And so it's driving innovation across a multitude of product categories. Therefore, formulating a plant-based product requires product developers to rethink and to recreate the organoleptically pleasing and functional properties. In dairy products, milk fat is an important ingredient and its crystallization has a significant impact on the structure of the product. But milk fat is complex and replacing it in dairy alternative products, well, it's, it's not an easy task. So the work I'm going to talk about and the, the work I, we've done it involves blending two uh, vegetable fats, cocoa butter and uh, coconut oil. Um, the first one is extracted from the cocoa bean that you may know in many chocolate products. And the second one is produced from the, co the cocoa nut. And uh, both of these fats uh, are solid at room temperature, but they have different, different chemical characteristics. For example, cocoa butter on the one hand contains long chain saturated fatty acid and also unsaturated fatty acid. It has fast crystallizing properties. On the other hand, coconut oil has high amount of medium chain saturated fatty acid and high oxidative stability. Fat and oil blending are widely used in food industry. It's allowed to produce uh, blended fats at an affordable price. And blending of vegetable fat with different properties is one of the simplest methods to create new products with desired specific properties. But here in our work, mixing cocoa butter and copra oil induced the depression of the melting point, the solid fat content, and the hardness relative to either pure fats. This kind of mixing behavior is typical when you have two solid fats that are immiscible. A solid um, immiscible fat uh, led to a tactic phase. A tactic fat mixture, it comes from the Greek, it means easily melted. Here, this is due to the structural differences of the molecules of the two fats, leading to fat incompatibility at different scale of organization. So the aim of this work is to investigate this eutectic behavior by studying the blending fat structure at different scale. We also analyze the structure of the fat blend from the centimeter scale down to the micrometer scale using a multi-technique approach. And the second objective of this work was also to understand the dependence of other factors, such as crystallization temperature on the eutectic behavior of, so, of these blends. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Julie, for a great presentation. Uh, I did get a chance to introduce you. You're a PhD candidate um, at the uh, Paul Pasquale Center for Research in the University of Bordeaux. So um, really enjoyed your talk. And we're going to open your talk up to questions from the judges now. Who goes first? <laughs> Philip, your turn. Philip. OK. OK. Go ahead. Thank you, Julie, for the talk. Um, well, it was a, a bit more difficult to follow because we didn't see the poster. Uh, so that's my comment, maybe on the in general on the talk. Um, but OK, it, it's an interesting topic eh, for sure. Um, so you mix, in fact, uh, coconut oil with uh, cocoa butter. Eh? They are both plant-based. Eh? Uh, 
Um, but okay, why should you choose one or the other? Um, then there are some factors in choosing them in, in food industry, of course. Well, the, the objective of my thesis was to uh, use cocoa butter for sure. Um, yes. Why we use co coconut oil? Um, we wanted to have um, a solid fat with high uh, amount uh, of saturated fatty acid uh, to, uh, in order to have uh, this, the, the advantage of the saturated fatty acid. Um, mm -hmm. So we didn't choose uh, palm oil uh, because of well, the environmentally sustainable approach that the consumer wants. So that's what we uh, we use uh, coconut oil and uh, we blend it with uh, with cocoa butter. Okay, and what is the product that you're targeting? So, I, I as I understand correctly, it's milk fat replacement by a blend of these plant-based fats. Yes. Well, it's a, a, a long, uh, a long way work because so I, I just beginning my thesis. The first, the first objective is to uh, understand well the cocoa butter and copra oil blending. But at the end, we would like to uh, put this uh, this fat in uh, into emulsion, and so uh, okay. that's why I talk about milk fat is because maybe uh, by uh, em emulsifying these uh, two uh, two uh, vegetable fats. Uh, we will be able to have this kind of uh, textual properties that we have with milk fat in. Uh, okay, in, uh, so you're targeting a dairy cream, in fact, or, or yeah, something yes. like. Yes, well, it's milk. very yeah. fundamental for for the yeah. beginning, but um, we will see at the end if, uh, 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 okay, if we have okay. this kind of. Uh, well, texture. you mentioned in your poster that you do a multi-scale approach, eh? so you also study the nanostructure. But I do not find any results in the poster. Huh? Um, can you That's say fine. something about that? What you really do on that the structural level? Yes, we well, we we did this uh, multi-scale approach on the poster and only uh, represent the micro scale and the macro scale. Um, but uh, we will uh, we are uh, right now uh, going to uh, analyze the nanostructure using. Uh, uh, X-ray diffraction uh, at the University of Bordeaux. So it's just new. Uh, we just mm -hmm. began uh, <laughs> last month. So we okay. would like to see, in fact, yes, if, um, well, first of all, we have kind of uh, cocoa butter polyformism uh, depending on the, the crystallization temperature first and also if there is a, a, what kind of uh, molecular packing we have uh, regarding cocoa butter when mm. it's mixed with uh, coconut oil. Yeah, yeah, I think this is quite important to, to understand it because yes, this is complex fact. Yes, this big, uh, big next step. Yeah. Yeah, 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 indeed, indeed. Okay, thank you. You go, Amanda, your turn. Okay. okay uh, I'll take the left. Thank you, Christoph. Uh, thank you, Julie. Uh, nice job. Uh, one of the things I liked that you did was to start off by asking the audience a question to pull us in. And by asking about our food, you made it very personal for all of us right from the start, because as we know, everybody, everybody eats. So we all have uh, thoughts about our, our diet. So um, I thought that was a good strategy to start off a presentation. Um, I wanted to follow up a little bit on this idea of um, uh, the, the eutectic um, and so you, are there things that you could do processing wise to, to minimize the influence of the eutectic on the product quality? Things that you're looking into, I think you, you said that you're trying out different melting temperatures or different, sorry, different crystallization temperatures. Uh, did we lose her? She disappeared from the screen, did she? Yeah, unfortunately it seems we lost connection there. Yeah. So we'll have yeah. Julie rejoin and we can always um, revisit the Q&A. So um, sorry, everyone, we'll check on Julie. I'm sure everything is just fine. Right now we're going to go ahead and go to the next speaker.
Julie, we're back. <laughs> yes, um, finally. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, you mentioned that you're planning to test out different crystallization temperatures um, and to explore the effects on melting temperature. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And then I was wondering if there's anything else that you, any other processing parameters you might be considering testing to see if that might influence the, the product properties um, and behavior. Yes, good question. Well, we, uh, regarding the crystallization temperature, we will also, uh, well, we have already uh, tried to see if there is a, um, an impact when we do uh, tempering because uh, while well, cocoa butter is uh, kind of a polymorphic uh, uh, fat. So we, we did also uh, a tempering, uh, a pre-crystallization uh, step before crystallization <clears throat> to see, yes, if we have this, uh, uh, the different results, and also uh, during during the, the the next few the next years, we will see uh, if there is an impact of uh, shearing. Uh, first of all, see if there is an impact of shearing uh, at a, a lab scale, and uh, maybe uh, when we will put this uh, this kind of vegetable fat into emulsion, uh, we would like also to see if um, uh, during shearing uh, in a um, Surface uh, scraped heat exchanger will also impact, uh, and we will uh, change the textual properties of the the final uh, the final fat mixture. Okay, thank you. Yeah, hi Juliet. Um, I think it's very interesting, but I agree with Philip that you had a lot of nice data and pictures in your poster. It would have been so nice if you also put in the slides for in the future. I think it's a great uh, it's a great prop for your storytelling. Now, the work you have done, I mean, isn't it very similar to studying cocoa butter substitute and cocoa butter or melting behavior and crystallization behavior, CBS and cocoa butters? Yes, well, CBS, well, so you're right, uh, but sometimes CBS is, uh, so cocoa butter substitute, um, like chloric fat, like coconut oil or uh, palm cannon oil, um, uh, this work has already been done, but uh, sometimes they only they just only mix uh, a few percent of this uh, lauric fat with um, with cocoa butter. So they don't have this. Uh, they they don't really uh, use and uh, and use and put uh, the spotlight on diuretic behavior uh, when uh, we mix uh, these two uh, kind of fat. And uh, here we also want to uh, to go deeper in this uh, multi-scale approach by really comparing um, when we will have um, SRG results, when really comparing the, not, the molecular packing with the microstructure we have and the textual properties of the, the fat blend at the end. Yeah, because I think, you know, if you want to go into the non-palm origin fat root, you know, then you have to often probably compare with a standard CPS, the fully hydro palm kernel stearines. And uh, one other question that uh, you had these SFCs in your solid fat content data, right? So which method did you use? Did you use the long method or also the, for the blend uh, different quick tempering method? Which tempering method did you follow? Uh, we only did uh, uh, for the SFC that I present in the, in the poster, uh, the, um, crystallization during a, uh, during, uh, uh, 19 minutes at uh, 4 degrees Celsius, but we didn't do, for example, the uh, IOCS uh, tempering method. Mm. Uh, but we, we we will do it because uh, in order to obtain this uh, the most stable polyforming form of cocoa butter, for sure, to see if there is a an impact yeah. uh, at the end. And I'm sure we'll hear more from you. And I think one final comment that you know when you have the ready the fat phase ready, if you're going to make actual chocolates. Keep an eye on the demolding behavior of the chocolates, you know, because the companies who love to have a shiny surface with their logo on the chocolate. So for them, the demolding properties of the chocolate tablet is also very important. So keep an eye on that. And yeah, next, that's time, good. next time when we meet physically, bring some samples, I'll volunteer to taste it. <laughs> Thank you. I will be pleased. Thank you. Excellent. Hey, Julie, we have one question from the audience. Uh, and it states, can we have this liquid behavior by mixing other fats? Uh, yeah, sure. Well, I, as I, I told the cost of, uh, we have this attractive behavior uh, when mixing cocoa butter with uh, other fat, other lauric fats, such as palm kernel oil. 
but um, uh, I, I, um, if I may remember, well, we have also uh, milk fat with, uh, when, when we have milk fat in high quantity, when it's blended with cocoa butter, we may have this kind of a tactic and incompatibility. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, enjoyed the presentation very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, so that's the um, closing of the first three speakers. So if you're in the audience now, we need you to go and vote um, for your top picks uh, of the first three speakers. And you can do that while we're moving on with the next speaker. So our next speaker is Annalise Jones. She's from Dr. Martini's lab, a good friend of mine at Utah State University. Um, Annalisa is a first year master's student at Utah State. Uh, she completed her bachelor's degree in food science at Brigham Young University in 2020. Uh, she joined the Utah State team and she's been involved in the club presidency, product development, college bowl, and research in Martini's lab, Dr. Martini's lab. And her research is focused on understanding and improving butter functionality in laminated doughs. So the title of her talk is Relationship Between Butter, Physical Properties, and Water Loss in Laminated Pastry Model Systems. So welcome, Annalise, and thank you for presenting with us today. Thank you, Doug. Okay, picture this. A thunderstorm hits and rain comes pouring down. As soon as you hear the rain on the roof, you've been trained on what to do. It's time to collect buckets, cups, bowls, pots and pans, whatever you can find to catch the water leaking through the roof. You have to save the sofa, the dresser, or the carpet, or the hardwood floor from the constant drip. If you have lived in an old house or even seen a movie of someone who's lived in an old house, you know the scene I'm describing. Although the leak may be ever so small, you still make the effort to protect your home from the rain outside. Eventually, this tactic of catching rain will get old and it's time to fix the roof. In my research, I'm not fixing leaky roofs, but I am working towards reducing a different kind of leak. My name is Annalisa Jones and I'm studying the relationship between the physical properties of butter and water loss in a laminated pastry system. Now, laminated dough is made up of two major components, the dough and the um, butter or the fat layer. Um, the pastry is prepared by folding and rolling the, these layers over and over again to prepare uh, one giant layer, one giant piece of many layers. Um, the, the pastry is folded and rolled and folded and rolled over and over again and that, um, and that creates the layers that help with rise. Both the butter and the dough layer are important in the proper rise of the pastry and the texture. The butter acts as a barrier um, between each layer, helping the layers cook separately, but also acts as a barrier from any water in the system. When the pastry is cooked, the water in the dough evaporates and um, turns to water vapor. This water vapor is trapped underneath that fat layer and it's, um, and it's what causes the rise creating air pockets in the dough. Um, this allow, allows for the flakiness and rise of croissants or puff pastries that you enjoy. However, the pressure of the rolling process takes a toll on the butter. And just like your leaky roof, the water and oil emulsion of the butter breaks and water can leak out of the system. This is one of the major struggles that we've seen and that we want to combat. In order to combat this leak, we can't simply catch drops of water like we would with pots and pans the butter needs to be strengthened. Um, I've studied the properties of commercial butter in order to identify what characteristics are correlated to water loss. We initially identified the amount of water loss in each of the commercial butter samples. This was done by following a procedure similar to the one I just described, folding and rolling. But in this system, we simply used filter paper instead of, um, instead of dough. 
we rolled out the butter samples in between the filter paper, took samples of that butter after rolling and measured the water content. We then compared it to um, a butter that had not been rolled out, just the simple control. And these are, um, these are shown in this chart, the control in the blue bars and the, the rolled samples or like the after rolling samples in the tan bars. Um, using a two-way ANOVA, we identified which of those had a significant difference in between the samples. The, it was identified that five of the 10 samples had a significant amount of loss. And these samples are all commercial butter samples. Um, after identifying the, the amount of loss of the rolled and the control butters, we tested the physical properties on all 10 samples, including melting profiles, solid fat content, water content, water droplet size, rheological properties, and hardness. We then performed a correlation analysis to pinpoint trends related to water loss. All characteristics were tested for correlation, but I will only cover the significant results. In the end, we identified a negative correlation between the solid fat content at 30 and 35 degrees Celsius, as you can see here. Um, this indicates that a lower amount of solid fat content in the samples at temperatures above room temperature followed a trend of higher water loss. Melting profile, including medium melting fraction, enthalpy, and onset and peak temperatures of the high melting fraction were also negatively correlated with water loss. Hardness was similarly determined to have a negative correlation. We're in the process of analyzing further testing to understand all the correlations. Um, understanding this correlation allows for the identification of the most important characteristics in pastry butter. We can incorporate those characteristics into butter production to strengthen the emulsion of the butter products. If we can fix the butter, we no longer have to worry about the leak. Thank you. All right, thanks, Annalisa. That was a great presentation. Uh, I really liked your comparison. So we're going to open up your paper uh, to the judges, and I'll let them decide who wants to go first. I can go first. Good, thank you. First, Philippe. OK, Annalisa, thank you for the nice story. Uh, nice presentation, a good pace, very clearly uh, told and also illustrated. Um, it's a very interesting topic eh, because this is really something which is happening in industry and all the industries using butter in laminated dough have uh, this problem. Eh? So it's really something also um, seen in Europe. Um, I was very interested by your folding method that uh, is also in your poster. You didn't show it in your pitch, but um, am I correct that this is like an, uh, a pasta sheeter that you used to... Uh, yeah to compress uh, the butter? And, and did you then do that continuously sometimes or it's only one compression? Yeah, so our full process, we um, would take the filter paper, put the butter on it and then um, put another piece on top and roll it through the pasta maker in order to make sure it's consistent with all of our samples. And so we started at like a, the largest um, gap that we could do and then went down, um, down to the sixth setting and we did that because we tested um, where we're seeing the greatest amount of water loss and where we can um, see that emulsion breaking. And we mm -hmm. noticed that was right at that setting. So we went through every setting, starting at zero, go down, going down to six, kind of to mimic yeah. that same procedure uh, uh, as in laminating when you okay. are layering it slowly. Yeah. One, yeah, one nice time. approach. Yeah, indeed. Um, in your poster, you mentioned um, also water droplet size distribution was determined with uh, NMR, mm -hmm. but I don't see results. Uh, yes. So on the poster. So I'm just curious: is there a lot of influence or relation with the water loss and uh, the water droplet size? Um, we didn't see a strong correlation, and that was actually really surprising to us. We thought that was going to be a bigger factor. Um, that is something we want to look further into. And though. what was uh, around the mean value of droplet size in your um, butters? It was right around 
Let me pull up the, <laughs> the stats. Um, water droplet was right around like between five and seven, which from mm. my um, yeah. from my research of other papers, that's pretty typical for commercial butter. Yeah. Okay, final question from my side. Uh, how does a producer of butter can influence the water loss? What do they need to do to so prevent if, water loss? Yeah, if we're looking at those correlation factors, we are wanting like a harder butter, some, and then we're also going to want something with a higher melting fraction. Because if if we have a higher loss, a higher or a, a lower solid fat content at like 30 or 35 degrees, then that's pretty highly correlated to water loss. Mm. But if we have do a you, do you think a producer can influence that? Um, I think that you could if you, one of the things we want to actually study in the future is fractioning the butter fat. Mm. So being able to fraction out those yeah. portions and then you could influence the amount of. Yeah, and then you can do reconstitution to the yeah. desired amounts. Okay, thank yeah, you. Exactly. Nice. Yeah, I'll I'll go on. yeah, go ahead, Amanda. Okay, yeah, go ahead. No. Uh, I mean, uh, Annalisa and, and uh, Philip covered most of the topics I was planning to ask, but um, oh. <laughs> so I should have been now, Christoph. <laughs> no, that's great. Hi, Annalise, um, really great job. Um, I was really surprised to hear that you're just in your first year of an MSc. Congratulations on um, so much progress to this point. Um, and we'll look forward to seeing you at AOCS in the future, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, so congratulations, and you told a really nice story. Thank um, you. With the leaky roof. Thank you. Um, I was, uh, yeah, I was curious. Um, you, you talked about um, formulating uh, butters with a higher solid fat content at 30 degrees or 35. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, how specifically would you recommend to somebody to, to do this right now? Is there a strategy you see that's viable? Yeah, kind of what I was saying before. Um, I think really that fractioning out of the butter um, in our future studies, we're planning on taking anhydrous milk fat and fractioning that and then adding it back to our cream to be able to see if that's going to change the effect. And so that's something we're we're planning on studying in the future. But I think that fractionation of the the butter fats is something that could help in that. Did you do any fatty acid determination um, of the different butters? We didn't in this study. Do you have a sense of whether they would vary significantly? Um, honestly, in this one, I can't say that I do. We yeah. got all of the um, just from the different manufacturers. It would be really hard to tell based on where they're getting their milk from or things like that. It would be really interesting to see that. Um, in Canada right now, we're facing something called Buttergate um, mm -hmm. because anecdotally people were reporting during COVID-19 that um, butter seems to be a lot harder. And this has led some people to postulate that it's related to increased feeding of palm steering mm -hmm. and palm fat uh, in the animal feed. Um, and so it's blown up into the into the news media a lot significantly. Um, so I'd just be interesting to also keep in mind this possible relationship between differences, slight differences in fatty acid composition and the, and the hardness and other factors. So really nice job, thank you. That would be very interesting, thank you. Yeah, Amanda touched a very good point. You know, the change in composition, winter versus summer or the feed, I think that can have an impact. Um, you know, I think so you started very well with that, you know, t uh, the raindrops or the drops coming in. And I, I originally am from India, so I know that if it is rains, if you're even within trees, the leakage and all that. So that was a good start. And so we had a French baker in our application lab. He would always say that, oh, don't bring margarine to my croissant. Let me work with butter. Mm -hmm. You know, that's probably what people like. So I think it immediately reminded me that, yeah, butter is definitely the preferred fat phase in, you know, to croissants and other pastries. But it's quite expensive, right? So in many countries, people do a recombined butter, which Philip was touching base on. They would take 60% or 70% AMF and put water inside. And with emulsifiers and high shear, they would still get a beautiful droplet size distribution, three to four microns to on a 50% distribution, which is quite good. I think much smaller than standard ones. <clears throat> but I think if you can look into it, I'm sort of, I don't think I have any specific question, but I think this, uh, your final conclusion, the looking into different fractions of butter, the high melting. Mm. And I tend to believe that if you remove the mid melting fraction, the high melting with some liquid oil, a little bit of that, you know, just, uh, health issues or whatever, that could be interesting. But one thing, uh, what was the ambient temperature of your room when you handled these butters? What temperature was it? Um, you know, in your lab, what was the room temperatures approximately? 
I need to convert to centigrade. So you have, probably yeah. will tell me in Fahrenheit. Um, you know? are, I do not actually know the specific temperature of our room when we, when we were because doing Because that could, yeah, I think that would play an important part, whether it is 18, 19 degrees or in the 23s or something that yeah. would affect, right? I think that's very true. And also that for every time you take out a sample, I mean, is it tempered to the right uh, temperature? If you have a series of samples, are they all lying in the room or you're taking out from a particular temperature cabinet and then lamin trying to laminate? And another point was that I've seen, uh, did you, how, what was the shape of your butter blocks? Were they like big cubes, blocks like brick or plates, more like plates? Um, it was bricks, but not, big bricks it's like a pound of butter but split into four bricks mm. basically because you know many a times you know i'm just showing at cough since sometimes if it is like this block and you have to kind of squeeze it down to a thin layer then you put much more pressure mm -hmm. on it right breaking the structure but many a times oh, yeah. in the industry they will sell it as plates pack it as two kilo plates so they don't need too much of compressive force so yeah. maybe next time, if you can, it, you know, talking to any company that you know, if they if you slice it and see the effect from a, starting from a, a, a chunk of butter to a slice of butter, a thin sheet. Yeah. So that could be interesting to see that effect. Yeah, sorry, I didn't. I misunderstood your question. When we yeah. rolled it out, we did slice it, so it wasn't okay. Thin. Okay, I'm sorry, I wasn't too clear. I think maybe oh, stand up. That's okay. But, I just... but no, I, I think it's very interesting. So yeah, thank you. Thank Good you job. so much. Thank you. And one question, comment question from the audience. Um, uh, dear Annalisa, maybe you lose oil too, but not water, question mark. So I think they're wondering if you're losing uh, yeah, some so oil as well. That's a good point. Um, I think that that would be represented in the, um, in the water content as well. We tried the same process with margarine and we actually saw that we did see oil loss with that one more than we did with butter, but that would be really interesting too, okay. to study. Thank you so much. Wonderful topic. Your great paper. Thank you. Hi, well, our next speaker is Kristen Patnode. She's a graduate student at North Dakota State University in Fargo, just up the road from me. Um, she graduated 2020 from North Dakota State with a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry degree. Her current research is focused on combining experimental and computational techniques and in the advancement of protein-based bioplastic films targeted towards food packaging applications. So in the title of her talk today, is protein ligand docking is a tool to predict properties and performance of plant protein-based bioplastic films. Thanks for joining us, Kristen. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for that introduction. Now, like you said, my name is Kristen Patnode, and I'm excited to share with you all about my work regarding protein ligand docking as a tool to predict performance of protein-based bioplastic films. Um, time is running out. Have you heard that recently? Um, this is a concept that's really been pushed to the front of many people's minds, especially recently when a clock in New York City switched to show the quote unquote time remaining instead of the time of day, which was suggesting the urgency with which we need to address the health of our planet. Indeed, images like those on the bottom of the screen um, are becoming all too familiar to us. Merchandise with quotes such as, you know, there is no planet B sell like hotcakes. And yet we continue to see dramatic and devastating changes to the health of our planet, largely caused by irresponsible plastic production, poor waste handling of plastic materials and the depletion of finite virgin resources. So how can we slow down the clock then? Well, much research is focused on developing bio-based specifically protein-based and edible bioplastic alternatives to petrochemical products. And this is really exciting work, but what if I told you that scientists have been developing these plant-based alternatives for nearly a hundred years? 
yes, advancements have been made, but not so far as to replace the more competitive petrochemical products. Clearly, we need bio-based alternatives, but we really don't have time. So I'd like to ask again, how do we slow down the clock? And I propose computational techniques. As demonstrated here, computational methods are faster than experimental work. Indeed, running calculations and simulating material interactions can be done in minutes as opposed to days. And while I mentioned that edible bioplastic studies have been underway for nearly a century, within those hundred years, no work has been done which utilizes computational techniques as an aid in bioplastic advancement, which is to say that computational methods have yet to be applied to edible application technology. So in my work, I use a combined approach where I use computational methods to predict experimental outcomes. I then validate those estimated findings by performing the wet lab experiments. This proof of concept demonstrates that we can accurately predict the properties and performance of protein-based bioplastic films for various systems, thus expediting the advancement of bioplastic alternatives to petrochemical products. So how does this really work? We use protein ligand docking, which I have here shown in the middle. Um, protein ligand docking simulates the interactions that take place between a protein and an additive. Since uh, protein-based bioplastic film formation depends on the physical interactions that occur between protein and plasticizer, we can fairly compare these computational results to real-life bioplastics. Then, by comparing those results across multiple additives and observing how and where each additive interacts with the protein, we can estimate the effect that each additive will have on the mechanical properties and water resistance of these materials. So when we go into the lab then, we're able to limit our film development to those additives and compositions, which we've predicted will have the most optimal effects. Now you may be wondering, is this effective and actually time efficient? And so I'd like to offer a tangible time comparison. Uh, my undergraduate student had spent 10 weeks optimizing a soy protein film modified with natural additives. And this was 10 weeks of wet lab work and experimental techniques. Using our combined approach, I was able to predict the same outcomes in just two weeks. That's five times faster than the wet lab approach. I mean, by that metric, all the advancements made in the last 100 years could have been done in just 20. So now what? Well, now that we understand computational methods can be used and accurately predict the properties and performance of protein-based bioplastic films, we aim to apply this technology to more diverse and more complex materials, thus further advancing edible bioplastic alternatives in a more cost-effective, sustainable, and time-efficient manner. And with that, I would like to thank you all for your time. Thanks, Kristen, for a great paper. Um, very interesting. Um, lots of potential advantages to using computational analysis at significant time savings. So I appreciate that. Uh, judges, can we open up Kristen's paper to questions now? Well, if I go first, yeah, uh, Kirsten, right? Yeah, Kristen. So yeah, I think it's definitely very interesting. And that's the way I think society civilization would go. Uh, my question is that, you know, just, um, with all the demand for plant protein as a part of our diet, I mean, there could be some leftover proteins from different sources, you know, from I don't know, chicken feathers and other stuff that has not been tapped into. Do you have an effect of the type of protein that can, is it nature of the protein independent or it has to be definitely plant protein based? 
That's a great question. Definitely there is some competition, like you're saying, with where proteins are being distributed. Um, so far, what we can tell from our approach is we've only looked at it for plant protein, but we chose, um, in my post, I talk about soy protein and zane protein, which are pretty dramatically different structures. Um, and this was intentional because then we're sort of bookending the, the, the approach. And with those, we were able to see, again, consistent, reproducible, and accurate results. So we would have to try it with a different type of protein, but my, my kind of intuitive feeling is that it shouldn't make um, a big difference on the type or the, or the source of that protein should not affect the predictability of this approach. Okay. So what's next in your resource? What's your next target? What do you plan to do with this? We're continuing to use computational approaches um, and furthering the advancement of our films to, to really start incorporating another oh. natural additive, which is a plant oil-based latex and see if we can still use the, the computational approach to predict effects of a polymer plasticizer. So, so one last question before I tell, let others chime in. When you have this kind of, uh, let's say a film packaging material, do you expect any kind of the microbial degradation or risk factor, any kind of microbial attacks or something? This is a really good question. Um, and there is some work that's been done previously about the effects of microbial kind of interaction mm -hmm. and degradation of these films, which depending on your kind of target shelf life could be an advantage or a disadvantage. Um, in the case of being a replacement for petrochemical products, it's actually an advantage that these would be mm -hmm. uh, biodegradable materials and readily biodegradable. So there is a concern that the microbial damage could happen too soon. Um, but so far in our work, we haven't seen that to be an issue. Okay. Thank you. And, uh, well, I hope you will, uh, you will come with more and more results every year so we can follow the whole progress. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Kristen, I'll jump in just to say I really enjoyed your presentation. I enjoyed uh, the tone that you took and the way you walked us through um, the importance of the work um, and even give a quick description of what computational techniques are for those of us who don't work in, when, work in that area. So I thought you did a really nice job. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes. And um, one of my, I had some questions about, you know, how you're deciding which additives to include. I think in your poster, you, you refer to them as natural. Mm -hmm. um, are these drawn from things that industry is already using, has already deemed to have influence uh, to, to lead to certain properties that would be desirable? Yeah. So the Three, ad we focused on some of the most commonly used additives in literature and industry. So um, specifically like glycerol, sorbitol, and, and cellulose, all of which are derived from natural sources, which helps maintain the bio-based advantage. But then also there, those three are shown to have different effects on bioplastic materials. And so again, trying to kind of bookend the different effects that we would anticipate to see and see how the computational approach handles those differences was the goal in choosing those three. So we were choosing ones that are not only prominent in research, but we anticipated different effects. So we could really um, sort of validate the, the predictability of that computational approach. Right, so then you define success based on whatever properties you're trying to achieve in, in the bioplastic that you're, that you're targeting? Yes, yeah, so we define success of our, our approach to be that the kind of predicted effects or the predicted results from the computation would then align with the actual measured results from experimental work. Right, and it's very um, cool, very interesting that you have that actual example from your own group showing that you had a five times faster process. Um, I, I liked how you brought that back to sort of showcase the, the technique, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, Kirsten, uh, very nice research, very good talk, explaining at a good level and that every can, everybody can understand. Um, I'm, I'm also wondering um, if this approach and uh, your computational method, can it also be applied to other types of structures? Uh, now you're studying bio-based plastic, um, but for example, those plant proteins, they're also used and studied nowadays a lot to form, for example, meat alternatives. Can this type of approach also be used to pre-screen or, or to, to have a better idea on how to, to get the innovative um, protein structures for this application? That's a really interesting question. Um, 
the way that our approach works with the film formation is that we're focused on the interactions between sort of our plasticizers and the protein. Um, so in our case, we're mostly screening at, um, the plasticizers. But if you were to translate that to, like you're saying, a meat alternative application, and you have a set sort of additive or a set system, you could essentially screen the protein. Um, the only limitation would be the size of those materials. Computation does sort of have a limiting factor of size and that as soon as you get to too large of a system, it, it no longer is able to function. So that is, it would say is the limiting factor in the meat alternative application, because I know there does tend to be some larger systems in those, mm. those materials. Yeah, okay. Um, now, now in real life and practice, um, protein properties, which you use in your product uh, development, they will also depend on how they were processed. Yeah? So how they were extracted, uh, is there a heating step already performed on the protein or not? Um, does your approach also takes into account these aspects when studying the functionality done in the, the bio-based plastic? No, so which is a really great question because you're right, the extraction process and how you treat the protein can have a significant effect on the results. With computation, we're a little bit limited in that we can only look at the structure of the actual protein, which we have to assume is going to be consistent. Um, mm. But what's actually interesting is that in preparing our films in the lab, we did have a number of different um, sources. So for example, you soy protein, but we had it from three different sources and all of those still showed consistent results with the computational approach which we would consider an advantage in that we can eliminate some computational time trying to treat the proteins um, computationally and instead we are able to actually use that native structure and it is shown to be accurate for proteins of number of different sources if yep. that answers your question yeah okay. <laughs> thank you very much Kristen, we have a question from the audience. You, I think you might have touched on this a bit. How well do you need to know the protein's tertiary structure to apply your methodology? Yeah, so the structure mm. of the protein, we like I said, we like to use the native structure, which um, in the case of our materials, for a lot of proteins, there's more than, than one significant globulin. And so I'll, I'll touch on soy protein because there are about four different prominent globulins in soy protein. And you do need those individual native structures, but we don't have to worry too much about anything beyond that. So a lot of those resources are available in the protein database and in literature that's done experimental work. Um, and what we ended up doing is using more than one of those protein globulin structures and then um, kind of mathematically combining those results to be cumulative of an entire soy protein sort of feedstock. Um, so the to answer, I guess, the question about tertiary structure, you'll need it to have a native structure of the protein. Um, and then understanding it does help in, in analyzing those results and kind of understanding which amino acid residues are where and how that folding might be affected in, in bioplastic formation does help in the analysis portion. But for the actual approach to run, um, we just need a native structure. Fantastic. So thank you, Kristen. Excellent paper and uh, good discussion. Uh, so that concludes the second half of the presentations. And now, audience, you can vote for your favorite uh, two from Kristen's presentation or Annalise's presentation, and that'll be tallied. And it will also tally all the results and get back to you with the winner of the competition and the runner-up.
right, welcome back. Hey, it's the result time. We're going to announce the winners. The winner of the Eat Pitch will receive $200, and the runner-up will receive $100. So and we actually have a tie for the runner-up. We have Kristen and Maria Tyne uh, for second place. So congratulations. And then our first place winner is Canal. So congratulations. Thank you so much, Doc. Yeah, so great presentations and really solid science. Okay, bravo. <laughs> Thank you so much. A nice yeah. question from the judges, actually. It adds the yeah. value to the research, actually. Yeah. So, so very excited for all of you. And, uh, thank you so much for participating and uh, judges thank you for uh, well thought out questions and interactions with uh, our fine scientists here today uh, and doc thank you very much for moderating this and amy you know you're always awesome denise and everybody thank you for making it easy for us we did the easy part you know you do you guys did do a much difficult part so thank you all for very much you know, for participating for being members of the eat increase the value of our division and it's been an absolute pleasure this evening. So all the best. Thank you.